288 for a song of invitation, number 288, I Need Thee Every Hour. The scripture reading is from Acts chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. But a certain man named Ananias, with Sapphira his wife, sold a possession, and kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy of it, and brought it unto a certain part, and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost, and to keep back part of the price of the land? Whilst it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost, and great fear came on all of them that heard these things. And the young men arose, wound him up, and carried him out, and buried him. And it was about the space of three hours after, when his wife, who not knowing what was done, came in. And Peter answered unto her, Tell me whether ye sold the land for so much. And she said, Yea, for so much. Then Peter said unto her, How is it that ye have agreed together to tempt the Spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of them which thou hast buried thy husband are at the door, and shall carry thee out. Then fell she down straightway at his feet, and yielded up the ghost. And the young men came in, and for found her dead, and carrying her forth, buried her by her husband. And great fear came upon all the church, and upon as many as heard these things. It is good to see you here this morning. If you don't have one of the outlines, raise your hand, one of those men in the back, be sure and take care of it. You know, as you read in the book of Acts, you find, of course, the beginning of the Lord's church. Grand event. Whenever uh, Jesus uh, proclaimed to the disciples to go and tarry in Jerusalem till they be endued with power from on high, they went there, and it was fulfillment of many prophecies that came in culmination on that day of Pentecost recorded in Acts, the second chapter. And whenever those things occurred, God added to the church daily such as should be saved, according to Acts 2 and verse 47. The church that Jesus promised back in Matthew 16, I will build my church, is now there. It's a perfect church. Christ is ahead over all things to the church, according to Ephesians, the first chapter. The uh, church is guided by that word that he gave, Matthew 28, 18 through 20, Colossians, the third chapter, verse 17. You find that the church is perfect. The guide is perfect. The standard is perfect. But there's a problem. You and I aren't. You look and you find the church had begun in Acts, the fifth chapter. Can you imagine people looking? You know, this is the church the Lord built. Did you hear about Ananias and Sapphira? They lied. They lied about what they got. Why would they do that? What kind of people would do that? Go over to Acts, the sixth chapter. Grecian widows weren't being taken care of. Hmm. You're about the church there? Got a little problem with some people in their own prejudice. Go to Acts 15, a little bit of legalism. You know, there are people saying you have to be circumcised. I mean, you know, all of these things, the church is perfect. But we who make up the church sometimes don't follow that perfect standard. And so a problem arises and we look and you say, what are we going to do? Now I got news for you. You know, we have an amazing congregation here at 39th Street. But from time to time, there are problems. Because the people here at 39th Street aren't perfect and sometimes we don't do the right things. So the question comes, what should I do? I've been called at times, and people will say, you know, I attend such and such congregation, and you're not going to believe what's happened or what's going on. What should I do? Well, I can give counsel on that, but 
we need to examine that ourselves because we're confronted from time to time. You know, maybe I don't do the right things in acting towards you. Maybe you don't do the right thing in acting towards me. Maybe things occur that we look and say, I just don't think that's right. So what do we do? Now, there's a lot of options that could be had, but what I want to do, I've got four options here. And by the way, this is from uh, an article. The basis of it is an article I read. I, uh, there are some sermons I get from my old black sermon book, just totally. But a lot of times I look and I'll read an article or I'll hear a sermon from somebody else and I'll adapt it. But I, I try to let people know, you know, I... I don't mind people using my material, and I know people who publish material, they don't mind it being used. So just to make things clear, the basis of this is from an article by a, a man named Caleb Cunningham. Don't know him, but years ago the article kind of caught my attention, and I thought, you know, that's something we need to be aware of. Well, I saw it the other day, and I thought, this is a good thought for me. Because I need to be able to tell other people, I need to address it myself. And you look and you find the first thing, you know, what's an option? Troubles come. Things don't go right. One thing you can do is, I quit. I'm done. If that's the way the church is going to be, I'm going to be out of here. Now, I know that that is something that sadly all too commonly happens. You know, before I was even a member of the church, I decided to do that because the first time I went to church with this beautiful lady that David referred to, I wasn't watching her sing. I'm going to be sure and watch her do that next time. But the first time she convinced me to go to services, I walked in and I saw a guy lead in prayer that I went to school with, and I thought... <laughs> This is a bunch of hypocrites here because I knew that young man. And I knew what he did when he wasn't in that building. And so I really told Lana, I said, I don't want anything to do with that church. Well, that's an attitude that people have. Once they become a member of the church, same thing. You know, Jack stands up there and preaches, but he did this. So what are you going to do? I'm going to quit. Don't want anything to do with them hypocrites. Well, number one, that makes me the biggest hypocrite around because I profess to be serving God, and yet I don't want anything to do with him because of you. Something's a little bit on a disconnect there. But the reality is I, I look at that, and I, I need to realize quitting isn't an option. If I understand what the church is, Acts 2 and verse 47, it's the body of the saved. I don't look at it as an option. I need to have something else in mind. I need to realize that my actions have an impact on everybody around. You know, whenever I quit, whenever I looked, I said, again, this is before, I, I never have got to the point yet. I need your strength. Need God's strength? Well, I won't ever face that. But whenever I did say I didn't want anything to do with the church, I did everything I could to keep that woman away from it, too. Strongest thing I did is I just wouldn't have anything to do with it myself. You know, she was enamored by me, and my influence was great. It's a horrible thing that I did. But as I get older, you know, I look out and I've, I've seen people, sadly, from this congregation get upset. And the reality is, a lot of the times, the elders have no idea what they're upset about. But they quit. And I look, and I've seen people through the years, they quit. And somebody else that I had been struggling to try and deal with in their family... Now quit too. They didn't want anything to do with it. Because that person who had great influence just showed them it wasn't even anything to be considered. So I need to realize the impact that I'm going to have. If I look and I say, well, you know, I don't care if I'm lost. I don't want anything to do with that church. 
I need to look and say, okay, that's exactly what I'm telling my spouse, my children, my friends, my neighbors, my co-workers. That at one time I said, oh yes, you need to be a member of the Lord's church. But then all of a sudden something happens, I get my feelings hurt maybe, or I see something that's legitimately wrong, and so what do I do? I'm through with it. That's not an option. It's tragic. You want to know one of the saddest verses in the Bible? Sometimes people say, well, you're going to go over and read about the crucifixion, aren't you? No. What happened leading up to the crucifixion was horrific. But there's one event that was a ways before it that every time I read it, I, I try and think, what would he have felt like? Jesus Christ came into this world and he gave a way he said, I am the one come from heaven. Scriptures were fulfilled in him. He had the right to stand as he would. The father saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. He had the right to say, whatsoever you do, you do in my name. He had the right to say, you go and you teach all nations. You baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and you teach them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded. But while he was teaching those disciples in the book of John, the sixth chapter, you find that he gave out some hard sayings. He didn't hide that. Matthew, the seventh chapter, he pointed out that the way to heaven is a narrow way. But in John, the sixth chapter, after giving these hard sayings, these individuals were offended. So what do you do? In verse uh, 66, from that time many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Jesus Christ left that heavenly home, came, he walked upon this earth, Disciples, learners of him, that's what disciples mean. They're looking, they're listening, they're following. I don't like that. And they turned and walked no more with him. You ever had anything like that? Have you ever had anybody turn their back on you? You know, we can all just bucket, well, it doesn't bother me. Well, it does me. You know, I, I, it hurts. I can look and I deal with it. You, you deal with it. We cope with it and say, well, I, <laughs> nothing I can do about that. But can you imagine being the Son of God and people turn their back on you? And then Jesus looking to those who were still with him, to the twelve. Will you also go away? by the way, knowing that one of them would. But you look at that and, and you think, well, I'm just not going to go. I'm going to take God, but I'm not going to take the church. I'm going to take Christ, but I'm not going to take his body. I'm going to take Christ, but I'm not going to take the way of salvation and the body of the same. How foolish can we get? And yet many people do that. They look and they say, I quit. And another horrific thing is, that's their choice. But we need to understand, before we get to that point, it's not anywhere near a viable, a proper, a wise choice at all. It's one of the most imbecilic things that anybody could ever do. Don't do it. That's not a response that anybody should have in regards to anything happening in the church. Well, there are other options. Well, another one that's often taken is complain. Now, this usually, it indicates, again, a disconnect because the church, and it's hard for me to talk about the church is perfect and yet we're imperfect because we are the church. And I need to understand that. But I need to understand that, you know, 1 John 1, you know, I sin, you sin. There are times when it comes in our life. Deal with it. Deal with the sin. Don't stay in the sin. That's not what I'm saying. We can't continue in sin and God's grace is going to take care of it. 
But whenever I look at that, I realize that whenever there's a problem, it's still we. You know, I, one of the first manifestations of this second is complain about the problem, you know, just deal with it. Listen how we talk about the church if we do that. Now, the proper language is we need to address this at 39th Street. We have a situation at 39th Street that needs to be dealt with. You, you put any congregation in there. But what happens is we go home, and on the way home, J.D. is talking to Polly, and, and I say that because I know he does that all the time. <laughs> but he says, you know, they're, they're doing things wrong there. They did this. They, when did it become I and they? When did the church remove itself from me and I from it? You see, the problem has really blossomed because I haven't dealt with things, and it's gotten to the point that I don't feel like I am part of the body. God added me in there. I can't just play like I'm not part of it. So I, I look, and I need to realize if complaining comes, one of the first things that ought to happen is whenever I sit there and say, they, I need to have a spiritual, I mean, it's, it'd be great if a spiritual hand would come out and just right across the face and say, what? Because it's not they. We are here. But complaining is easy. Especially if you can find an ear that will listen. You know, there is a description in the book of Jude about false teachers coming in. It says they crept in unawares and they turned the grace of God into lasciviousness. In other words, Jude, as he wrote, he says, I, I have to write that you contend for the faith because of these people. But the picture is they came in by the side door. That's what the word description would be. And so whenever I get to this point, if I become a complainer, I'm going to try the waters a little bit. You know, I'm going I'm to be around Dale and I'm going to say, huh, that was really strange, wasn't it? Dale may say, uh, I don't know what you're talking about. Maybe we need to address something, you know, with the elders. So I back away. You know, he's not the one I want to talk to. But then I go over here and I talk to John and I say, you hear what Jack said? That really threw me. And if John says, yeah, I don't know what's going on with Jack. I mean, the bulb lights up. And I think, I got a compatriot, an accomplice. Come tonight and you'll find out what I mean by that. But then I begin using him as a sounding board, he is me. And then we look out for others. In other words, I am so upset that I'm going to try and turn everybody against them. It's going to be me against them, but I need more on my side. And so the complaining starts. Over in the book of 1 Corinthians, you find in the 10th chapter, the reality that, you know, the things of old, they were written for our learning. In 1 Corinthians, the 10th chapter, beginning in verse 6, he says, uh, These things were our examples to the intent that we should not lust after the things that they also lusted after. So here you find lessons from old. And you, you look, you begin to read, Neither be idolaters as were some of them, as it is written. People sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Boy, idolatry, that's a terrible sin, isn't it? And then, neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in the one day three and twenty thousand. Whew, fornication, that's terrible. Let's not tempt Christ as some of them also tempted were destroyed of the serpents. <laughs> what tempting. That, how can anybody tempt God? Yet they did it. Neither murmur ye, as some of them are murmured, and were destroyed to the destroyer. <laughs> well, I don't want to talk about that one. You know why? Because murmuring is kind of fun. It, it's fun to tear down other people that I'm upset with. I remember Wendell Winkler, he was one of my instructors at the uh, school of preaching I went to, and he'd, uh, he'd illustrate, you know, 
he talked about, I remember studying in the Old Testament, we got over there, and especially whenever they left Egypt, you know, what they do is murmur. And he used to get up, and he would use a, did you ever think about how murmur, murmur, I mean, the word sounds terrible. But God says, that's what you do. Complaining, griping, murmuring. But what we fail to realize, fornication, idolatry, emptying Christ, murmuring, he put that in the same category? Yeah. It's not a small thing to use the option, which we can. You know, we can make choices. But it's not a simple thing to sit there and say, well, you know, all I did was complain. You know, the church is in disarray, and boy, I added to it, and I'm kind of in the back of my mind, I, <laughs> I taught them, didn't I? Murmurer. God looks at that and shows us how horrible that is as you look through the Scriptures. I need to realize whenever I want to address the problem that I see, in that way, how horrible God considers that to be. So that's not an option. But then I say, okay, watch my hands of this. I don't care. It, and again, this comes from their problem. They're going to do that. I can't do anything. Not my problem. So I just become indifferent to it. I don't care. Now, how's that going to solve a problem? What's that going to do? You don't see the value of, I don't care? Look out in society. I mean, Lan and I, you know, we were driving down the road the other day. We were going uh, yesterday to a, a place over in Kansas and driving down I-70, and I looked up ahead, and here's a, a nice new Camaro. Ooh, pretty nice looking. White, red stripes, convertible, over on the side of the road. Sometimes I'll tell Lana whenever we pass things like that, you know, I wonder if I, I give him $100 for that. <laughs> I got closer to that, and somebody had apparently worked it over with a baseball bat or something. The top was crumpled down, the windows broken out, glass all around it. Look, I said, how can anybody do that? Can't remember exactly, but I'm sure Lana said, because people are evil. You know why people are evil and do things like that? Because somewhere in their life, they became indifferent. I don't care if I destroy their car. I don't care if I sell them drugs. I don't care if I destroy their life. I mean, you, in the news, there's been all of this stuff about sexual predators and harassment, and it's all coming to the forefront, how all these people did that, and how can people be that way? How can they be that way in all these different realms? Because they don't care. It's all about me. So I don't care about them. And some people get that way on the church. I don't care. I'm not going to do anything. Not my problem. And they simply back away. How could they do such a thing as that? Over in the book of Revelation, you find a church that pretty much that way, it seems. In the book of Revelation, the third chapter, you find in verse 15, there is this church, Laodicea. And it's the only one of the seven churches that not a single thing is said good about them. The other six, God tells them to repent, all except one. But you look, and he tells them, there's some good things you have. Laodicea doesn't have it. You know what the heart of their problem was? Verse 15 I know thy works, thou art neither hot nor cold. I would that there were cold, that you were cold or hot. So because thou art lukewarm, neither cold or hot, I'll spew thee out of my mouth. I don't care. 
Don't care about what happens here. Don't care about them. God says, I'd rather you be opposed than to be indifferent, be lukewarm. He says, I'm going to vomit you out. That's what that means. Anything ever make you sick? You know, I hadn't been to a certain restaurant for a long time, a little fast food restaurant. I went in there one day, and I got a hamburger, and I threw up for about two days, it seemed. I go by there, and I don't really want anything to do with them. I know what it is to look and say, I don't want anything to do with you. I'm going to vomit you out. I don't want God looking at me that way. Yet I need to realize that if I look and I say, I don't care. I don't care about the body of your son. I don't care about the fate of the saved. I don't care about the fate of the world because this body isn't going to do its job. I don't care. Not my problem. God says, you make me sick. Well, what then can we do? How about help make things better? How about do something? You look and you find that there are things that every single one of us can do. The biggest mistake we can make is saying, I'm not important enough, I don't know enough, I'm not this type of person, I just, I can't make a difference. I can do what I can. You know, one of the first things is, go talk to the elders. You know, I said a moment ago, we've had people leave, and I've had people come through the years and say, well, you know, so-and-so, they're just not going to come back. No. Why? Well, I'm sure you know. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> Maybe I'm dense. I don't know. Sometimes I'm not the most observant person in the world. I walked into a gym yesterday, and I was looking all around trying to find my wife, and finally my grandson ran up, and I asked him, I said, have you seen Ami? And he just <laughs> said, no, and then looked, she was standing right beside me. Sometimes I am the definition of oblivious. You need to tell me. I tell people, you know, the eldership, we're not mind readers. And everybody always assumes that, you know, well, the elders know. No, they don't. Not unless somebody tells them. Because generally the, problem, the person with a problem, we approach them, everything's fine. Notice you hadn't been attending as you should. What's going on? Nothing. I'm fine. I guess we could turn on the light and interrogate them, see if we could break them, but it doesn't work that way. So go to the elders. Tell them. You say, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> the problem's with the elders. Go to the elders. You know, that's what God said. You got a problem with somebody, what do you do? You go to that person. Talk to the elder. That's one of the best things you can do. Talk to them and say, okay, why is this? Is this right? Is this wrong? Why did you do this? Don't let it become a problem. But then as you do that, you realize that, okay, well, somebody in the congregation has a problem. You know, maybe Jack's got this character problem that needs to be dealt with. Help me. Instead of going and telling everybody, you know, Jack's preaching has really just beep, gone downhill. Help me. He said, well, Jack never preaches on. You know how many times I've asked for sermon subjects? 35 years, I could not tell you the number of times that I have told the congregation, if there are subjects that you feel need to be addressed, let me know. I will do my best to work them in. Sometimes it's not a timely thing that I can do, but I said, I will do what I can. You know how many times I have had recommendations of sermons? The majority of them come from little ones. Could you do a lesson on? And they give me a lesson. Rarely 
do I get a recommendation for sermon? But there have been times, and not very often, I've been blessed this congregation, but there have been times, and not very often at all, that I've heard from other people, well, they just don't like your preaching. What don't they like about it? I don't know. Maybe I'll talk to them. <laughs> I talk to them, but they don't tell me. So-and-so says, you never preach on this, or you preach on this too much, or you preach this way too much, or you do this when you take your glasses off when you preach, and you put them back on when you preach, and that really bothers them. <laughs> I, I've got a thick skin, but I hope I've got a tender heart too. And I can guarantee you every single one of the elders, every single one of the Bible class teachers, they're all the same way. As a matter of fact, we all ought to be that way that we have an open heart to being helped by others. One man said, you know, it's better than cursing the darkness to spread the light. Tell somebody, I'll help you. Instead of determining to quit, be the one who is steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, who can look to others and say, come on and follow me. I know you're struggling with this. Come on and follow me. You need some help. I'm here to help you. Anything I can do, and I'm serious about this, I'll help you any way I can. I'll be there. You need to come over to my house? Come on over. You need to give me a call? Give me a call. Be the one who is a worker but encouraging others. Instead of complaining, how about in Ephesians, the fourth chapter, you speak the right thing. I mean, you know, you look... And, you know, it's one thing to look and say, you know, Mike, he just grates on my nerves. How about going up and saying, you know, Mike, I could go tell everybody that, or I could go to Mike and say, you know, you and I are a lot of different people. And I'm sure... <laughs> I, do, I know I do things that just get on people's nerves. And I just want to tell you, you know, if you see me and I look like I'm standing off, you've got this habit of doing this, you know, maybe the way you speak, maybe that, and it just, it just kind of hits me the wrong way. I love you, but I wanted you to know that that's there. And, you know, if, if I can help you with that, I just wanted you to be aware. Well, that might hurt Mike's feelings. But I can guarantee you, Mike's going to get over it. But what might happen, too, is that little divide that was between you and him is now taken down. There's an open line of discussion. Because I've gone to him in a proper way, and I've told him. He knows that, yeah, sometimes we all do things to grate on each other. We all do things that offend others. But, you know, we also know we can come to each other and help each other through that. And if we be brethren, we can deal with it in a way that he says. And instead of being indifferent, you know what an indifferent person is? A person who says, oh, them people, they've chosen their way, I'm going to... And you come and you attend. You sit in the pew. Be about through this sermon. Never heard anybody pray that long. How many people he's going to pray for? Then when it's over, I'm out the door. Because I don't care. But I'm just not involved anymore. I'm gone. Instead of that, why don't I try to provoke one another unto love and good works? John's been studying the book of Hebrews. If you're in that adult class, you know, as he went through Hebrews, the 10th chapter, about the one another aspect that is there. We provoke one another unto love and good works. We exhort one another in the assembly. I'm not here to get a tick mark on my attendance card with God. If that's it, there's a problem. <laughs> the assembly is to worship God, but it's to exhort and encourage one another. So I'm a part. I don't want to be an attender. I want to be a member of the body of Christ. 
So instead of being indifferent, I'm going to be involved. I've told the story. You know, my mother, bless her heart, whenever she was uh, a young Christian, she attended a congregation in uh, Fort Worth. And I went down there and we went to services and said, well, it's time to go. She said, no, we got a few minutes. She had it timed where she could leave the house, walk into the building at the last minute, sit on the back row, and when services is over, she was out. Well, why do you do that? Those are the most unfriendly people you've ever seen. Is that right? So the next time we went, got her there early. Went up, we talked to different people. Introduced her to people she'd been worshiping at the same building for a while, but hadn't been worshiping with them. A little while later, she, you know, those people are the friendliest group of people you've ever seen. <laughs> she made a decision. I can talk about how they are, or I can insert myself. And sometimes, God oblivious people like me, insert yourself, come up. Tap me on the shoulder, whatever you need to do. But I need your exhortation, and you need mine. You say you don't, you better reread God's Word. He's the one who said you did. And I believe him. I know it. So I look and I see, you know, what, what am I going to do? Well, in all honesty, there are times to leave a congregation, but not leave the Lord. There are places you get whenever things are such a way and they're not going to change. I can't worship there in spirit and truth. I cannot be growing as a Christian there. So what do I do? I leave that congregation and I find one that will be beneficial to my relationship with God and one another. But I need to do that. I don't need to become indifferent. I don't need to complain. I don't need to quit. I need to be a part of the solution of the Lord's church, striving and growing to be as it should be. Dealing with imperfect people, realizing that if I'm there, I'm one of them. I need help. And so I press on. But I do it with the congregation. I face the problems with the congregation. And we are examples encouragers and overcomers because we wouldn't give in to the devil we surrendered to the Lord we're talking about the church of course if you're not a member of the church none of this really matters because we've got a problem talk about that sin problem well sin separates you from God all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, Romans 3 and verse 23. The wages of sin is death. But God wants you to have eternal life. That life is in his Son, and so I make the choice. I'm going to go to him through his Son. That means that I'm going to accept that faith comes not from a prayer that I offer or something that comes to me in the middle of the night. It comes from hearing the word of God, Romans 10 and verse 17. Based upon that faith, I realize I need to make some changes in my life because what I read isn't what I'm living. So I bring the changes about. That's called repentance. And God has commanded all men everywhere to repent. Based upon that repentance, I confess my faith in him before others. A eunuch desiring to be baptized was only allowed to do, to do that after he had let it be known that he believed that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Based upon that, he went down into the water. And just like you and I, if we're going to be a member of the church, we're baptized into Christ, Galatians 3, 26 and 27, for the remission of sins, Acts 2 and verse 38. And it is then and only then that God adds us to the church. And we have the ability then to join with others, assemble in a congregation, be a part of the good work, and face what the devil throws at us together. If you and I haven't done that, we're in trouble because we're separated from God. But if we're doing that, we are blessed beyond measure. We can help you to do it. Let's do it as we stand and sing the song of invitation.